Hi, Kelsey Peach here. Thanks for joining me today. Hey, I have a question for you. Are you a Christian? If you are, if someone were to come up to you and ask you, who is God and what is he like? What kind of an answer would you give to that person? Now, maybe you're not saved and so you perhaps don't have the right answer for them, but I want to try to answer that question to help you because Peter, the Apostle Peter, said to his readers, he said, I want you to sanctify or set aside the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense or an answer to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that where when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conscience or conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better for you to suffer if the will of God is so that you suffer for doing good rather than for doing evil. We live in a day and age that's really upside down. Would you agree with me on that? I mean, people are calling good evil and evil good. People can't even identify their what sex they belong to. They want to change what they've been given rather than accepting it and, and doing things to glorify God. But getting back to our question, who is God and what is God like? You see, if you can answer this question correctly and have, a, have the right view of God, as A.W. Tozer said, the man who comes to a right belief about God is relieved, as it were, of 10,000 temporal problems, for he sees at once that these have to do with matters which at the moment are just for the moment. They're not very long. They're not going to go on into eternity. You see, as soon as you die as a Christian, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, which is far better. That's what the Apostle Paul said. You know, it's not, some people have the idea, I feel sorry for the Romanists who have to go into heaven supposedly through the back door or the side door. They don't get to go directly at upon death into the presence of the Lord. But that's not what the scriptures teach. That's an addition that the Roman church has added uh, to enslave people. But, but Peter says here, I want you to set aside Christ as the master of your life and be ready to give an answer. Now, to the question, who is God? I think one of the best answers is, God is the creator and the sustainer of all things. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John, or, uh, that's Genesis 1.1. John 1.3. All things were, came into being by him. Same thing in the book of Hebrews. In the book of Colossians, it says that Jesus Christ, the God-man, was the one who spoke into existence everything that you see around you both the visible things and the invisible things that we can't see, the spirit beings. And there are plenty of them all around us, whether you realize it or not. And uh, sometime maybe I'll share with you what the scriptures have to say about spirit beings and how some have suggested that maybe even today, as it was in the Old Testament times, they took upon humanoid form and came and spoke to people. Some are suggesting they talk about aliens, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But that's another subject in itself as far as spirit beings are concerned. But my friend... If you come to a right understanding of who God is. Now, A.W. Tozer in his book, which I would recommend that you get, it's, uh, this is a large print, print that I picked up, but it's called The Knowledge of the Holy. Now, he, uh, a, he says that an attribute of God would be, be anything that is true about God. Now, I would perhaps schedule it a little, little differently than he would, but I think it's well worth your while to buy this book, get a hold of one of these books, and read it because... As he says, if you would come to a correct understanding of God, many of your problems would disappear. Maybe you're anxious and full of fears and worries right now with the world condition as it is. Well, Paul told the believers in Philippi, he said, let not your heart be troubled. I mean, I mean in Philippians 4, 6, he says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. Now, let me read it actually for it. I, I think I know it by heart, but... It's, it's in Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 6 and 7. He says, he says, stop being anxious or be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer. Now, this is the idea of worshiping God, prosukomai, and also with supplication, crying out to God, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And when you've done this, as a believer, it says the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Would you like to have the peace of God in your heart? You see, you receive peace, you get peace with God at the moment of your salvation. Uh, Romans 5.1 says, 
Therefore, being justified by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for our sins and rose again, you have peace with God. You're no longer considered his enemy. Okay? You have peace with God. So you may be saved and have peace with God, but maybe you don't have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding because you're all worried about all kinds of things concerning which you ought not to worry. He says, stop. You know, he says, cast, Peter says, cast all your cares upon God, or upon me, because I care for you. And why should two of us stay awake if we got problems? No, learn to talk to the shepherd if you're having trouble sleeping at night uh, rather than counting sheep. You know, maybe go over Bible verses that you've memorized. Think about the promises that God has given to you. If you don't know what promises are for you, write to me and I'll send you some that can hopefully get you started. Now, you've got to be careful that you don't try to claim promises that were given to the Old Testament believers and then say, oh, God didn't answer that promise to me because if you're not a Jew, you can't claim some of those promises. Now, some of the promises in the Scripture are repeated, in essence, in the New Testament for us as grace believers. But you see, you can't claim every promise in the book. It's not all for you. Uh, we have to make a distinction between Israel and the church. God hasn't forsaken the nation of Israel. He has a bright future for those that are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, who, when he comes back, he's going to set up his kingdom here on earth. And, of course, there's a lot of other things that are associated with that understanding and uh, the relationship of Israel with the rest of the nations. But that's another subject in itself. But anyway, uh, there's a song that we used to sing in our church down in Kansas, and it was written by Don Moen, and I like it. It's kind of a very simple little song. It's uh, called Think About His Love. Think about his goodness. Think about his grace that brought us through. For as high as the heavens above, so great is the measure of our Father's love. Great is the, fe uh, is the measure of our Father's love. How could I forget his love? How could I forget his mercies? He satisfies, he satisfies, he satisfies my desire. Now I'm going to put a link. Maybe you haven't heard that song. It's a good song. Now, I wish you would have gone a little bit further than that because I want to talk about not only these attributes that he talks about in the song, but some other attributes as well because you have to have a whole, uh, a complete, clear picture of God as to who he is and what he's like if, you're gonna, if you want to have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. You can't leave out, you know, the... You can think about his love, you can think about his mercy, you can think about his grace, you know, but you also think about God's holiness, God's righteousness, God's omnipotence, as well as, um, as his omniscience. So we want to look at some of those things, and I hope that this will be helpful to you. And I hope that you'll share this with somebody else, because maybe you're doing all right right now, but there might come a time when you will need this information. You might need to go over it again. And I have this you know, in a printed form as well. I use it basically as an outline to, to share things with you. And so I hope that you'll look it up in the references <coughs> to uh, confirm in your own thinking uh, these under, this understanding. Now, Paul says in 2, 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4, he says, God comforts us, not so that we'll just be comfortable, but he comforts us so that when we've made it through the, the hard waters and the hard times of life, we can encourage those who are coming behind us and say, listen, God has provided for us. He's took, he has taken care of us, and he will take care of you. And I like that song, Be Not Dismayed, Whatever We Tide, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. Maybe you know the rest of that song. It's a great song. You know, and we think about, you know, God doesn't actually have wings, but that's, you know, in the, so we can understand that idea. You know, that like a, Jesus said, as a, I would like to have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you wouldn't come, Jerusalem. You Jews wouldn't come for the most part. And so God sometimes uses that kind of a figure of speech. But anyway, let's think about uh, God's love. Let's think about his goodness. Let's think about his holiness. Now, you see, if you are a Christian, you ought to know these things about God. So let's think about first about, about God's love. God's love is desire for the highest well-being of the objects of his love. It says, God the Father, this is John 3, 16, God the Father so loved the world, that is, the people caught up in this system that was devised by the devil to enslave us. God loved us, the people of the world, so much so that he gave his only begotten Son, God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, he gave his only begotten Son that whoever would believe in him, that is, in the Father and the Son, 
would not perish, that is, be ruined for the purpose for which we were created, but have everlasting or eternal life. You see, God loved the world, and he demonstrated that love for us by sending the one, God the Son, who had volunteered to come. You see, in the council meeting in eternity past, they decided that the three persons of the God had decided that they would create man. That's what Genesis 1.27, let us make man in our image. Those are plural pronouns which tells us that there's more than one person in the Godhead. They're not three gods. There's one God that exists as three persons. Now, I know that's a difficult concept to understand, and I'll be honest with you, I don't fully understand it myself, but I accept it as truth because the Scriptures teach that. Okay. So God the Father loved the world. He seeks the highest well-being of those whom he loves. And he sought that. He extended that love. He demonstrated that love by sending God the Son who identified us with us human beings by taking upon himself a human form, a human body. And Philippians 2, 5 and following says, let this mind be in you, and it talks about that. But he took upon himself a real human body. He lived a sinless life. He had no sin nature. He died as a substitute for your sins and mine. He was buried for three days and nights, and then he rose again bodily on the third day, and he offers salvation to any and all who would believe in him. So God loved the world. Now, some people have the idea that since God is love, that therefore he would not send anybody to hell. That is not true. Because if a person does not respond to God's love and believe and accept the gift that God has provided for that individual, and it might be you if you're not a saint person, if you don't accept that pardon that he provides for you, he has no other choice but to send you to the place that was prepared for the devil and his angels. You see, so God did love the world, and he does seek our highest well-being, but if you choose to reject him and the offer that he provides for you through the Son, through God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as I mentioned, the gospel is that he died for our sins and rose again. If you refuse that, then God will have to send you to the place where you're going to perish forever. Now, keep in mind that as in Mark... Um, what is it, Mark chapter uh, 9, verse 44, 46, and 48. It says that the, where it's a place where the fire is not quenched and the worm is not destroyed. Now, what is it? That's in essence. What is it talking about? Well, the lake of fire goes on forever. And my friend, we don't want you or anyone else to go there. Salvation was never provided for the rebellious angels that became demons. But salvation and deliverance from that awful place was provided for people like you and me. And I get excited about that because I think, you know, if God saved me, he can save you. He can save anybody. Now, Paul referred to himself as the chief of sinners. When I think about my lifestyle prior to my being saved, and even sometimes after I've been saved, when I rebelled against God and didn't do what God wanted me to do, I think, how in the world could God love me? But God's love for me is unchanging. Now, you see, because God loves me and I'm his child, if I get out of line and I don't confess my sins quickly, I could be disciplined because it says, whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scour scourges everyone whom he receives. See, He does that because he loves me, not because he hates me, because he's cruel. No, not at all. He does it because he loves me and because he knows I'm not going to be punished with the unsaved people in the lake of fire forever. That's why the Christian gets disciplined in this life, whereas unsaved people seem to get by with murder. And I mean that literally. Uh, there's some people who do that, and, and somebody else gets blamed. You know, they go into court, and somebody else gets blamed, and has to spend the rest of their life, or gets the life sentence, because, you know, somebody had more money, and they were crooked, crooked uh, you know, people that were involved in the situation. That happens quite often. And maybe you know somebody that has had uh, unjust... Um, sentence imposed upon that person. There are people like that, but we need to recognize that vengeance belongs to God and he will repay in time. See, um, Maybe you know somebody incarcerated in prison. Sometimes people get saved in prison. Uh, maybe you can share some information, this information with somebody who's in prison. Now they probably can't get this in the video form, but you could give them a gospel tract or like this in Spanish or English or I don't know, 123 languages. Or you can give them this gospel booklet. You know, it's very helpful. Or other things that we can help you help others. See, uh, we want, as Paul told Timothy, he says, the thing, Timothy, that you have learned from me in the presence of many witnesses, 
you find other faithful people, other faithful believers, to whom you can impart this information, and they can impart it to other faithful people. You see, we don't want to just stop with us. Oh, me and my family, and you know, uh, we're, we're safe, so we're fine. We're not going to tell anybody else about. Well, what kind of a selfish attitude is that? We want to share the good news, and I believe, folks, I really believe with all my heart that this particular dispensation of grace in which we live is very sh shortly going to come to an end when the rapture is going to take place. Now, I thought that back in 1959, the 60 came in. I thought, man, it, you know, how could we go into the 60s? I thought that. But I try to live every day as though the Lord might come back. And I try to think about what can I do to help other people uh, if they don't know the Lord, to come to know the Lord. I want to make sure that you hear the gospel clearly and what you need to do with reference to that, to believe, not to believe and do all these other kinds of things that Ron uh, Shea talks about and, and all the, the things that you, you can check this out. Just go to my website, kelseypeach.com. The good news and the bad, the bad news and the good news. Read it. The first page there. And uh, maybe you're depending upon the wrong person, maybe the Christ of the cults. Or maybe the wrong methodology. You're thinking it's faith plus works and you're not going to make it. But think about God's love. And then think about God's goodness. Now God's goodness, uh, it's, it's the idea that he delights in the happiness of others. And um, he is a good God. He does delight in our happiness. But what we think might make us happy may not be what really makes us happy. Every good and perfect gift comes from God, James 1, 17. And sometimes God withholds from us things that we think we have to have, and we have to have it right now. But you see, God is a good God, and he delights in the happiness. He loves us. He's a good God. He delights in our happiness. And when we understand that it is the goodness of God that leads to salvation rather than the wrath of God. I know from Revelation chapter 16 that in the future, when the terrible time of the tribulation and all these things are happening to people, rather than them calling out to God for mercy, they blaspheme God and say, why are you doing this to us? And it's really a pathetic situation. And that's why I want to encourage you, if you're not a believer, to accept the goodness of God that has been demonstrated toward you and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're saved, recognize that every good and perfect gift comes from God and be thankful. What do you have that you didn't receive? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 says. You know, maybe you have, um, uh, maybe you're proud of your race. Well, there's only one race, so why are you proud of that? Maybe you're proud of your face because you have a little different bone structure and skin color and all that kind of, you know, you shouldn't be proud of that. Or maybe your position, your place in life, your race, your place, your face. See, maybe you think you've, well, you know, because you're so smart and everything else that you're in the position that you are. But what do you have that you didn't receive? It all comes to us as a gift from God. So we think about the, mer let's think about the mercies of God. Now the mercies of God, I think, are an extension of God's goodness, but I understand the mercies of God having to do with the compassion that God shows toward those people who are suffering, whether that suffering comes from their own wrongful or sinful behavior or the wrongful or sinful behavior of others. So let me say that again. It has to do with God's compassion for people who are suffering. Now, you may be suffering because of something that somebody else did to you. We had in our church out in California a lady who, when she was quite young, uh, or I should say younger, and uh, there was this, she was walking in a pedestrian crossing, and there was a young 16-year-old gal that wasn't paying attention, and she ran into her and her sister, and that poor lady has th had to walk around in a walker the rest of her life. Now, it wasn't her fault that, you know, she had to walk around in a walker. It was this young gal that wasn't paying attention. And maybe somebody has done something to you that is causing you to suffer today. Maybe your parents did something. There's a lot of children that are suffering. My wife used to work in a hospital over there and take care of babies that were drug babies because of the parents. It wasn't the child's fault. You know? So the mercy of God, you know, I, I like this, the song, what the songwriter said, the mercies of God were the theme for my song. Oh, I never could number them more. They're more than the stars in the heavenly dome or the sands in the wave-beaten shore. 
For mercy so great, what return can I make? For mercy so constant and sure. I'll love him, I'll serve him with all that I have as long as my life shall endure. That's a great song. And I hope you know of that song. If you haven't, look it up on the internet. It's a great song, The Mercies of God. And this is what, in essence, Jeremiah cr cried out to God in the book of Lamentations. He saw his own people, the Jews, being taken into captivity because of their idolatrous practices and also because they wouldn't observe the sabbat sabbatical uh, uh, the Sabbath and also the sabbatical years and, and they went into captivity f for 70 years because they violated the sabbatical years for 490 years. God says, I told you to let the land rest and they didn't do it. See, So God says, you want idols? I'll give you idols. And he sent them to Babylon. But the mercies of God, they're new every morning. Think about God's holiness. Now, he doesn't mention that in this particular song, but we must not forget the holiness of God, which has the idea of God's um, separateness. Uh, it's being separate from all others. I like to think of it in the human terms as reference to his moral purity. He says in 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, he says, I want you believers to be holy like I am holy. Be separated unto me. Now, if you're separated unto God, you're going to be separated from all these other things. Now, usually the idea is, well, if I just separate from all these unsaved people, never associate with them, you know, and all that kind of stuff, that's, that, you know, and then you think of yourself more highly than you should. No, when you're separated under God and you're focusing on God, you're going to be automatically separated from the things that displease God. That's why in 1 John 2, 15 through 17, uh, yeah, he says, stop, stop loving the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man should love the world system, you can't at the same time love God. And the world, is, the world system is passing away. You can use it, but don't abuse it. See? So as you're focusing on God, you're not going to be able to love the world system. And the same thing is true with reference to the holiness of God. When you're separated unto God, when you've devoted yourself to God, and you're available to Him at a moment's notice, and in your I like to use the, the acrostic, you can be fat free, I've heard the fat one, you know, faithful, available, teachable, but I like to think of it as being fat free. You be faithful, available, teachable, flexible, resilient, you confess your sins quickly, evangelistic, and enthusiastic. See, that's what we need to be spiritually. Did you get that? Faithful, available, teachable, flexible. Uh, I'll go where you want me to go, Lord. It's not what I wish to be, nor where I wish to go. For who am I that I should choose my way? The Lord shall choose for me. It's better for me to resort to him and say, God, what is your will for my life for today? Be in the position where God can use you for his glory and for the good of others. So be faithful, available, teachable, flexible, resilient. Confess your sins as a Christian when you're, you don't have to come... You know, you don't have to think of everything you've ever done as an unsaved person before you can get saved. No, but as a Christian, if you should confess your sins, he will forgive you. And then be evangelistic. Uh, and then be uh, enthusiastic. You know, people get excited. You know, Japanese people that are normally right, rather uh, sedate, you know, when they go to a ball game, baseball game, man, they get wild. You know, and you, would, you, know you see them on a train or someplace else, it's completely different. But anyway, I just think about, you know, the, these attributes of God. And God is a good God. He's a righteous God. He's a holy God. And he, he wants us to be holy. And also his righteousness. Let's think about God's righteousness. God always does what is right. Now, sometimes we don't think he does, but he always does what is right. And he demands that a payment for sin be made. You see, the wages for sin is death. Not only physical death, but spiritual death. God told Adam and Eve back in the garden, or Adam specifically, he said, if you eat of this forbidden fruit, you're going to die. Dying, you will die. In the Hebrew, it's actually in the plural. They didn't know what death was. Neither did the devil. Now, the devil's lie was, you won't die. Uh, he told the truth when he said, if you eat this fruit, you will be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil in that one area. But the lie was, you won't die. But the scripture says, the wages for sin is death. You see, every person that is born into this world is born spiritually dead. And that's why we have to be born again from above. We need a new nature. We need a nature that comes to us from God. We participate in the divine nature when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior through the message of the gospel that he died for our sins and rose again. So, as we think about that, God insists that the payment be made. And if we had to pay for our own sins then we'd have to be eternally separated from God. But you see, Jesus as the God-man, the value of Christ's death comes from the fact that he was, he was and is God. 
The reality of his death comes from the fact that he was a man. He was the God-man. See, God can't die. There was a book a while back, you know, God is dead. No, God isn't dead. He can't die, see. And uh, even once you're conceived, you are going to go on and exist forever. There's everlasting existence. It doesn't mean everlasting life where you're going to spend eternity with God. And we don't believe in universalism, as some people are falsely teaching. Um, I think uh, that guy that wrote the book of the shack, he, he believed in universalism. I think William Young, I think his name William Paul Young, uh, he teaches that, er that heresy that uh, in universalism, eventually everybody's going to get saved, including the devil and demons and so forth. That's not true. That's not taught in the scriptures. So anyway, as we think about uh, God's righteousness, Christ paid the debt. Now, let's think about God's omniscience. God knows everything about you and me. You can't hide from God. You know, we talked a while back about, you know, how Mark Twain said, every man is a moon. He has a dark side. He wants nobody to, to see or know about. See, Well, God knows everything about you. Uh, Psalm, read Psalm 139 sometimes. He says, where can I flee from your presence, God? He says, no matter where I go, you're there. You, you know all about me. And 1 Corinthians 4, 5 says, not only does God know everything that we say and do and think, but he also knows the motivation behind our actions. And that's, you know, a little scary because sometimes we think, oh, you know, I, I'll pretend like I'm doing this for this reason. But God knows all about why we do what we do. And at the Bema Seat Judgment for Christians, he's going to unveil that. You see, it's not to determine whether we get into heaven or not. That is the Bema Seat Judgment for Christians mentioned in 1 Corinthians 3 as well as in 2 Corinthians 5.10. No, it will be to evaluate our works to determine what kind of rewards we will get or not get at that particular time. The same thing is true with the Great White Throne Judgment for unbelievers who stand before the Lord. Their degree of torment in the lake of fire is going to be determined at that time. As I've shared with you in the past, the people in Hades, in the heart of the earth right now, all unsaved people that are there, are suffering equally. But when they stand before the Lord, that's when justice is going to be meted out. And uh, people are going to suffer. There are degrees of suffering. And I think the hottest place in hell, uh, in the lake of fire, is going to be reserved for false teachers and false prophets. And there are plenty of them who teach other ways of salvation. Paul talks about them in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He says they have a false gospel and they come and present themselves as angels of the light. They're deceivers. And it's very important that you be under the protection of a good Bible-believing pastor who uh, cares for your well-being and your spiritual growth. So um, God is a righteous God. You can't hide from him. Now, Maybe you're lacking confidence in yourself. If that's the case, good. Learn to have your confidence in God because he is the one that is worthy of your trust. I think of the words in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean in on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths or make your paths straight. God loves it when his children say, Papa, what should I do? You know, I remember when my son, late son Bill uh, used to call me sometimes. We'd talk on the phone and he'd say, Dad, what should I do? I'd say, son, I, I can't really tell. I can give you some principles, but I have to, you have to learn to depend upon the Holy Spirit to lead you as to what God wants you to do. I can you know, try to decipher what he wants me to do, but I can't decide for you as to what you should do. Now, here are some principles from this word. And you ask God for wisdom. James 1.5 says, If you as a believer ask God for wisdom, he'll give it to you without saying you dummy or, or operating you. He loves to give wisdom to those who ask him for wisdom. So if you're, you know, uh, you know, sometimes people that are very self-confident, they're strong natural leaders, well, I'm going to do it all my way. You know, it's better to do things God, God's way. Now, I've shared all this with you because I, I, as I think about this, I, I like this song it's written, that Don Moen wrote about. But I like to use the acrostic myself when I'm in the middle of the night and I can't sleep or something. I use a little different acrostic. It's, a, it's one that I've used for several decades. It's, he says the crazier it is, the easier it is to remember. But I use the G-R-O-O-T-H-L. It's not a word, but I think, okay, G stands for God's goodness. R stands for God's righteousness. O stands for God's omnipotence. Another O stands for uh, God's omniscience. His omnipotence. Uh, T, let's see, that stands for God's truth. Oh, yeah. God is truth. Um, he sees things as they really are. Uh, G-R-O-T-A-H. H. Now, well, that stands for God's holiness. 
and then L stands for God's love. So I think of these things in my mind. And when you think these thoughts, you are in essence worshiping God. You're telling God that you know something about him. And when you flesh that out, it will really help you as you are facing the struggles in life. Because my friend, if you're saved, the struggles of life are going to end when the Lord comes back or when you die. Now, if you're not saved, my friend, your best life is now. Now, there's a preacher that wrote a book called, entitled, Your Best Life Now. It's not for me as a Christian. My best life is in the future. If you're an unsaved person, you can say, this is the best life you're going to have because when you die without Christ as your Savior, you are facing eternity without Christ eventually in the lake of fire. First, the, the jailhouse in Hades, in the heart of the earth, where there are people in torment. You can go to Luke chapter 16 for that. But then in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, at the great white throne judgment, you're going to be just according to your works, and your degree of suffering in the lake of fire forever will be determined at that time. Now, my friend, we don't want you to go there. We don't want your friends to go there. We don't want your family to go there. We want to share the gospel with people because we believe that everybody who is alive is savable. We don't believe in what's called limited atonement, that Christ only died for the elect. There are some serious problems that are associated with that and the presentation of the gospel. You can't say to somebody, if you're not sure he's one of the elect, you can't say, my friend, Christ died for your sins. I had a man get after me one time when I put that on the stamp. Christ died for your sins. I can go up to anybody that the Holy Spirit leads me to and I can say, my friend, Christ died for your sins. First John 2, 2, he's the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. And I can tell a person, honestly, my friend Christ died for your sins. He was buried and rose again on the third day, bodily. If you'll believe in him as your personal Savior, right now you'll be saved. And that's when your life begins. That's when you need to start growing. That's when you need to be baptized, not before. Now, it's not believe plus be baptized, believe plus do good works. No, it's believe and you'll be saved. Once you have been saved, then there are many things God wants you to do. He wants you to be baptized. He wants you to devote, present your body to him as a living sacrifice. He wants you to grow spiritually, starting out with the milk and going to the solid food. He wants you to serve him while you're here. What's your purpose for being here? To serve yourself, serve the devil, or serve God? Well, I want my purpose to be to glorify God and make him known. And then reproduce yourself. I'm hoping that through these broadcasts that you will help me by simply pushing share and like, and it can go out to other people. Uh, I just shared something with a lady that was wondering about her own salvation. I shared with her, you know, I sent her some private stuff perf um, to look at, and she said, I'll read that. And that's how we want to help you. So I hope that this has been helpful to you. And if it has, please put share and like. If you're watching this by YouTube, I guess it's subscribe, and there's something else you can do. And then if you read my blogs, and I'll post this so you can go to it, and read the text that's associated with it, and you can look up the scripture references, because I want your faith to be based upon the Word of God, not just because I say so. Uh, I want to teach the truth to you. I realize my tremendous responsibility. James 3.1 says, don't be desirous to be many masters or teachers, because we will face greater judgment if we teach false doctrines or heresies, and I don't ever want to be guilty of that. And I always want to be teachable. And if somebody can show me from scripture that I'm in error, and I can, the Holy Spirit illuminates my mind to that truth. I want to be able to say, hey, I, I will change my thinking. But I like what old M.R.D. Hahn, Dr. M.R.D. Hahn used to say. Well, that's what I believe. Until you can show me from Scripture that I'm wrong, I'm going to hold on to this. And uh, I want to keep growing. I want to keep learning. And I'm going to do that throughout the ages of eternity. Ephesians 2.10 says, that the, in the ages to eternity, God's going to keep on revealing things to us about himself that we didn't know before. That's an exciting thing to think about. And my friend, perhaps today the Lord might come back. And if he did, would you be caught up to meet the Lord in the air? If not, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. If you are saved, then share the good news with others so that you can earn the crown of rejoicing that God promises to those who are faithful Christians who will share the message with them. That's all. Thanks for joining me. This is Kelsey Peach asking God's blessing upon you as you are obedient to him and his word.